afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another FinGeo online seminar. I'm very pleased to introduce Professor Suzanne Suderberg. She's a professor in the Department of Global Development Studies at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. Her research interests are, are broad and varied, ranging from global development finance, global governance, corporate power, debt, urban poverty, and state theory. If we want, we could just fill a whole series just with each of those themes, and we could have Susan for the whole series, but we're just having her for one time now. She has investigated these themes across many geographical spaces across both global north and global south. Um, and among numerous scholarly publications and special issue editorship, she has authored several books, including two award-winning monographs, Corporate Power in Contemporary Capitalism from 2010, and Debt for States and the Poverty Industry from 2014. She has recently published a new monograph, Urban Displacements, Covering Surplus and Survival in Global Capitalism, which is from this year. And this is uh, gonna be also the topic of our talk today. Susan, the floor is yours. Um, as as I do, I am um, my start video and play. Can everyone see that? Yeah, I think yes. it's loading now. Yeah, it's coming. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Stefan, and thank you, Manuel. This is such an awesome series. Unfortunately, I was teaching during this time, but teaching is over now at least here in Canada. Um, so I'm happy to, uh, and hope I can see some more. And thank you, Alex, for helping with all the tech. Su Suzanne, so maybe, maybe, this maybe it is good if you turn off your camera because it's still breaking up a little bit. So let's make sure the bandwidth can focus okay. on your voice. Okay. Okay, but you can still see the... I can still see can the slides. Still see? Okay, yeah. fabulous. Okay, so I am looking at urban displacements today, and aside from just shameless promotion of the book, um, what I want to do um, is to sort of throw critical light on a very dark underbelly of financial capitalism slash financial geography and look at poverty um, and its very close cousin, um, urban displacements. And so what I've done today is organize the talk into three sections. I'm going to, um, in the first part, just briefly look at um, definitional framings, um, some of the issues that I'm looking at in the book, uh, but for the talk. I'm going to focus on the case of Berlin um, just for time constraints, but the book does cover Vienna and, and Dublin. I'd love to talk about those cases in the Q&A as well. Um, and then I'm just going to wrap up with some reflections that I hope are provocative and will open up a more, um, there's just a, a lively discussion for those 30 minutes. I'm gonna speak quite quickly because I wanna hit the 30 minutes and, and you know listen to what you have to say and, and your input because there's a lot of people in here that, that I wanna hear what you have to say. <laughs> um, uh, you've been used in the book um, quite uh, frequently, I'm seeing here from, from of the audience. So let me just start with the first part of the talk, which is the framings of displacement. And here I just want to focus on this image of a family that we can see that are living in a commercialized um, place of survival. This is a hotel room. They're a homeless family that are living in a hotel room in Dublin. This many this has been a regular occurrence uh, throughout from the 1990s onwards. Um, and I think that's a really important point. You know, this, this um, housing of the homeless within these these privatized, you know, for-profit um, um, spaces is something quite um, new, but also that these people, you know, live and engage in, in activities of social reproduction, of caring for their young, homework, et cetera, trying to eat as much as possible with limited, absolutely no cooking facilities for not just one day or one week or one month, but in many cases, at least in Dublin, for at least two years. Um, and from this hotel room, this family will get displaced several times as um, you know, there's high uh, season in terms of tourism or if there's a in town, they will be asked to leave and will have to find another place um, of survival. And this is one of the concepts that I try to develop in the book of displaced survival in which these, these spaces of insecurity within financial capitalism and urban, urban geographies are produced and reproduced over the last several decades. So this isn't just a temporary phenomenon. This is definitely something that has been part and normalized of everyday capitalism. 
So why am I looking at rental housing? So most people in, in uh, this seminar know that growing uh, the rental housing is a growing uh, rental uh, housing sector. It's comprised of social housing or public housing, same thing, and the private rental sector. Um, the, it, it's uh, home ownership in many parts of the world, especially in the global north, are, are still dominant, we must say. But in places that I'm looking at in Berlin, Vienna, the rental housing tenure has always historically been quite high with about 85% um, rental tenure. Dublin, on the other hand, is not as high at around 40% rental tenure, but it has been growing. And it is really interesting to understand that that number is in comparative terms quite quite important because Ireland was and, and contained the highest amount of home ownership in the EU at one point. So this is quite important. But for me, the most important um, facet of looking at rental housing is that there are places in which the urban poor reside and from which they experience displacement in ever growing numbers around since 1990 at that time. So what do I mean by displacement? So effectively, I mean a removal from a place of security to a place of insecurity, stigmatization and exclusion. Those hotel rooms or hostels um, are, are one example. And later we'll talk about the refugees and you know, emergency shelters and communal dwellings as other places of insecurity. Um, displacements are both visible and invisible. I began the talk with that image of the tent city, which we know has, has emerged and expanded in the recent crisis of the pandemic. But, um, you know, and, and it's the, one of the most violent um, expressions of displacement, homelessness, and especially rough sleeping. But a lot of the homelessness, the radar. So people sleeping, um, you know, on people's couches, couch surfing, friends and family, overcrowded conditions, um, and people living in, in these commercialized places of, of, um, of homelessness, right, like hotels. So there's tangible and intangible elements to displacement, which are important. Um, and displacements are not a one-off static event, right? There's cycles of, that begin with over-indebtedness, then lead to evictions, and then homelessness. And there are important racial, class, and gender dimensions of the displaced. So why displacement? So for me, displacements um, are very much so of the urban poor aren't extricably linked to the historical and geographical dynamics of financial capitalism. As the urban poor are enrolled as renters and debtors, but also as precarious workers, because I do see labor market conditions and, and, and we'll talk about this later, but mm. how that is very much so part of thinking about financial capitalism and its expansion and conditions. As we know, you know, reading back from Engels's work or other people um, uh, in this room, <laughs> this virtual room, displacements are not a new phenomenon, but they're integral to capitalism. So one of my key questions in the book is how do we make sense of urban displacements in contemporary capitalism, particularly in this moment of financial capitalism? How is it produced and reproduced? And so by financial capitalism, I am leaning primarily on a historical geographical materialist framework, um, David Harvey and the likes, but I also lean on global political economists, people that have looked at the European Union um, from a, a political economy perspective, scalar sort of understandings of neoliberal um, intervention, also critical race scholars and feminist political economists to capture the various dimensions of, of what's going on. So for me, inherent to financial capitalism are these interscalar modes of neoliberal governance ranging from the EU to the national level to the urban scale, right? And this facilitates wealth in the face of income inequality, precarious unemployment and growing impoverishment. So, you know, these numbers to you, but it's always worth to this, like, you know, this, this ugly, darker side of financial capitalism that, that breeds urban poverty, um, that between 1980 and 2017, the wealth of the 1% of the EU grew more than two times faster than the bottom 50%. And 1% accumulated 17% of the income in the growth of the EU over the last several decades. So for me, and thinking and, and leaning on Harvey, particularly, um, financial capitalism seems to be underpinned by at least two levels, levers that are vital to its expansion, right? And one is the credit system, which we can, we can think about in terms of surplus money sloshing around, right? All these, these trillions of dollars of derivatives, for example. And I really like the idea of the former uh, Greek uh, finance minister when he used the concept of the twin peaks, right? That financial capitalism has two 
mountain of idle money and a mountain of debt. And I think that's really interesting to show, you know, we always talk about the power of financial capitalism and it is very powerful, but it's also incredibly fragile, right? Um, and one other aspect, one other lever that's really interesting that Harvey talks about and of course Marx is the relative surplus population. And, and here I thought that was it's a really interesting to bring in this largely ignored facet when we're based on a ethical materialist framework um, and looking at this so-called so relative surplus population. And you know, it means a lot of things, uh, the way that Marx uses it. And in the book, I am very clear that for me, um, my relative surplus populations are welfare recipients, so people engaged in involuntary part-time work, zero contract, and temporary work, um, as well as long-term unemployed. So those working are unemployed for more than one year. Um, that was a very specific group that I'm looking at in terms of the relative surplus population so that I can see the tension between the sort of expansion of, of, of credit money vis-a-vis -vis the other lever of uh, financial capitalism. So for me, fi financial capitalism is a historical social spatial relation that is crisis-ridden, it's contradictory, it's incomplete, and there is a class dynamic, um, by which I mean I'm very cognizant of the labor component in terms of understanding this, this concept and developing it throughout the book. Okay. So from that largely abstract uh, <laughs> concept of, of financial capitalism, I developed more, more sort of, you know, meso uh, concepts. And one of them is displaced survival. And by that, I mean everyday violence of insecurity and modernization of the urban poor. And specifically, one of the key tensions I pick up on, which I think um, fits really nicely in that surplus money and surplus workers, is this violence that is increasing in the tension between rental housing as a place of survival or social reproduction, if you will, and a site of accumulation. And again, this is not a new uh, conceptualization um, in a Marxian sort of understanding of housing in capitalist political economy, but I really want to draw that, that tension out. It's, a, it's an important focal point within the book and trying to understand the social reproduction um, and production of displaced survival. So, uh, end this section by stating that my, the argument that I'm putting forward in the talk today, because we need a thesis, is that class-based facilitation, which obviously for me includes also gender and race, um, and the normalization of urban poverty and social marginalization of the working poor, aka the surplus population on the one side, and the expansion of financial capitalism on the other, be it the rental system, be it the credit system through consumer debt, be it also platform economies, gig economies, which I see very much so part of a holistic understanding of financial capitalism. So I'm going to turn to the second part of the talk, which is pushing against, you know, we see this housing for all. This, this, this section is going to be a lot more concrete than the first uh, section. I'm going to be looking at the Berlin case, as I mentioned in this section, but I'm also at the same time implicitly having fun with this housing for all solution to the housing problem or the housing crisis. And in particular, the reading of the problem itself as a housing crisis, as something that is very much so presented in the mainstream discourse as, um, as and, uh, as, and, and, and government discourse and EU discourse um, at all scales of, of, of neoliberal governance as a historical and an apolitical sort of understanding of, of the housing crisis, right? Um, and housing for all in most cases are very much so embedded in these, these limits um, and present a very technical solution, right? That we should, we should um, encourage the uh, imbalance between housing supply and housing demand by um, freeing and encouraging the rational individual private actors to do the right thing and build and price these, these um, uh, necessary um, affordable housing that we're all still waiting for decades later. But that said, I'm just going to give you some some brief um, highlights, at least from the, the uh, EU and also the national uh, level of uh, neoliberal intervention that I think uh, play out and help shape um, what's happening um, in, in Berlin. So first, um, the EU, as we know, has, has been constant. Um, its policies have been geared towards a constant downward pressure on wages and the generation of surplus workers trapped in either long-term unemployment or chronic underemployment. I mean, this is a huge marker of financial capitalism. Um, and I think this is, this is really helpful in terms of understanding how that tension 
um, between spaces of survival and um, sites of accumulation really play themselves out in urban geographies. And the second is, of course, the sort of larger umbrella of neoliberal governance in the EU that facilitates ongoing privatization you know, of housing, we'll talk about later, marketization and individualized means of survival, right? People living in the hotels, for example, by prioritizing dictates of economic competitiveness, growth and stability. And here in the book, I really um, play, you know, I really believe that the European monetary Union and the stability growth packs and the like are really, really important political um, structural sort of issues that have, have created this, this environment of producing and reproducing displaced survival on the ground. So yeah, and those are, I mean, there's many more. I'm just giving you some highlights here in terms of time. So in Germany, the same type of sort of neoliberal interventions in terms of restructuring have played themselves off. The EU uh, larger macro policies, of course, have, have um, you know, uh, resulted in a situation where Germany has experienced the sharpest rise in low wage work in the European Union since the 1980s, right? It's the hotbed for low wage work. And the majority of workers that hold low wage are women and migrants. And here's where the gendered and racialized aspects really play themselves out also in Berlin. And as you know, Manuel has eloquently written about the privatization in Germany, the, the, the privatization of social housing units is, is, was massive in the 1990s, right? There was something like 2.6 million um, units that were privatized during the 1990s. And of course, during this period of time, there was also the devolution of housing responsibilities as in many countries from the federal level to the Lenda level. And of course, let's not forget the HOTS4 program, um, which, also helped reconfigure labor market reforms and create lovely um, inventions such as welfare reforms that were very much so um, you know, guided by workfarism, right? Where you basically trade welfare and very reduced amounts of welfare with um, work. And then, of course, the controversial debt break. Um, and, you know, it's a stop and go, sorry for the pun, with the, the federal debt break but it's still there. And I think ideologically it plays a huge role. So the debt break for people that don't know was instituted in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis. It came into effect in 2016. And it effectively is, is written into the German constitution that the federal government can fiscal deficit cannot exceed 0.35% of its GDP per annum, right? So it really um, institutionalizes, institutionalizes, if you will, um, fiscal austerity. But what's really interesting is that at the lender level, that number is zero, right? Um, and so that really, really um, is important for poorer Lenda, such as Berlin and especially Eastern, Eastern um, Germany or former Eastern German um, Lenda. So let's look at displacements in Berlin. We've had those sort of um, interscalar sort of framings. And now we're going to look at Berlin. So I'm gonna start with the 1990s and bring you up to speed to present day. So 1990s, um, you know, Berlin was undergoing these double debt burdens from German reunification, um, as well as the devolution that occurred, um, <clears throat> excuse me, with the federal government um, devolving its responsibility to the Landa. So Berlin, for those that you don't that don't know, is a city state, which means it's both a capital city and a state. Um, so it absorbed a lot of the financial costs with devolution. So in 2001, though, the city experienced the largest banking crisis in post-World War II history and of Germany. And this involved this building that you're looking at here, the BGB or the Bankgesellschaft Berlin which was at the time the largest savings bank in reunified Berlin. Um, Berlin um, the Berlin government held about 56% shares in the BGB, which it used to fund these large infrastructure projects tied to reunification. When the BGB collapsed in 2001, speculative real estate deals, the federal government refused to bail out the Berlin Senate. Right. And this was huge. And I think it was also reflective of, of the same sentiment that um, created the debt break um, years later. So Der Spiegel, which is a German um, weekly German newspaper, predicted that the 2001 financial debacle would cause social conflicts of undreamt of scale in Germany or in Berlin. And they were correct. 
The Belian government embraced austerity urbanism and privatization several years before it would be forced to do so in the wake of the 2007-2008 financial crisis. And the Berlin government, for instance, and this is important to our discussion today, amongst other things, sold off 13 of its 19 municipal housing companies. So these are public housing companies, right? The remaining six municipal housing companies were subject to market principles of economic efficiency and managerialism which drastically transformed the public rental sector. For example, rental rates in some of the municipal housing companies were higher than the private sector. And at the same time, Berlin, as with other parts of Germany, as we saw in the previous slides, was experiencing growing levels of under and long-term employment, right? This low wage sector work in the service sector, the gig economy, often held by migrants. So in one of the most, for example, stigmatized boroughs in, Neu in Berlin, which is Neukölln, over 40% of the children live in homes that are dependent on welfare provisioning, where they are compelled, and this is a more updated number, compelled to live on four euros per day for food. 43% of the population possesses a migrant background and 23% are considered unemployed. So these spaces, these urban spaces within Berlin also experienced the highest levels of over indebtedness, evictions, and, and homelessness. In other words, displaced survival. So as all of this was going on, we have also the um, privatization or the, the holdings of 243 rental units that are held by landlords, uh, real estate uh, companies. And one of them is Deutsche Wohnen. And Deutsche Wohnen owns about 113,000 units in Berlin. But recently, another one, there's about a dozen um, other real estate companies that own the rest of them. Venovia, which is a huge um, real estate company in Germany, is trying to take over Deutsche Wohnen, um, which is quite problematic on many levels. Uh, but it also shows these trends towards the centralization of power of these financial actors within financial capitalism. So urban displacements in Berlin are, you know, express themselves as increase in rental payments coupled with precarious labor market conditions resulting in displacements. There's high levels of over indebtedness, um, in the case of rental arrears that result in evictions and homelessness. And this happens not just in the private rental sector, but also through the, its municipal housing companies, that there are um, significant displacements through their municipal housing companies as well. The key people that are displaced are migrants, so Roma, Turks, and Serbs, um, housing organizations that I speak to, the very few refugees that are accessing rental housing, we'll talk about that in a few minutes, will be the sort of next round of people that will join this demographic, they believe. So both men and women, families, right, experience cycles of displacement more than their German counterparts. So important racialized dimensions in here. And in stigmatized boroughs, notably Neukölln, displacement is more widespread than other districts. Now, Mitte is also experiencing very, very high levels of, of displacement as well. So this is quickly changing, especially during the, the pandemic. Okay, so we're gonna fast forward to uh, 2015. And I was undertaking some um, interviews in this building here which translated is the Office of um, Refugee Affairs, loosely translated. Um, our integrating the refugees and providing housing. And after I was done the first of two interviews that morning, I realized that I was sitting in the BGB, the Bankazer Shafelin that went kaput in 2001. And as I was listening to my informants talk about the refugee crisis and at, at best, you know, blaming the victims for, for, for this, the mess that Berlin was finding themselves into, yes, it's disconcerting that uh, these bureaucrats were talking that way, but for our purposes here, um, at, at, at best, they were all then, you know, when I pushed them, they're like, well, it's really the housing crisis, right? We have a housing crisis. And again, you know, why do we have a housing crisis? Well, you know, the, the disequilibrium between housing supply and housing demand, and, you know, this sort of very technical, temporary, apolitical and ahistorical understanding of the crisis, which I thought was really interesting, especially when, you know, we think about what was just happening in 2001 with the BGB in the same building that this, this um, Office of Refugee Affairs was housed in, and it was also temporarily housed. It was too displaced from this building a few years later. 
But, you know, the refugee crisis is, is interesting because there's another crisis, right? I mean, as I said, financial with all of capitalism, you know, uh, uh, evolves, if you will, I hate that word, but maybe progresses, other not great, so word, but moves along a, a crisis restructuring continuum, right? And there's constant crises. We're never, you know, as Marxists, I mean, I'm, we're never surprised of crisis, right? But these are really interesting crises. The refugee crisis then meeting the already um, crisis of, of, of displaced survival. So in 2015, Berlin received 55,001 refugees. Um, you've got to love German precision there. Um, tapering off to 17,000 in 2016. But this was the highest number in Europe. Berlin received the highest number of refugees in Europe in, in terms of um, urban centers. And these refugees, as we've seen from the discussion, had to confront internal placements that were sharpening every year. And it was believed, and it's still believed, that there's three types of dwellings available to refugees, the emergency shelters, the so-called communal accommodations and tempo homes, and rental housing. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about number one and number two, and I'm just going to tell you I've straightened off rental housing because it really is not an option available to refugees. At best, the rental housing are places where um, refugees live with friends and family in overcrowded conditions. That's the best case scenario. And there's very few through the Berlin Senate um, that offer um, you know, a handful of flats every year in their municipal housing companies to refugees. But for the most part, they cannot access these rental housing units. So the two types that are available to refugees are emergency shelters. Now, Germany has shut down a couple of years ago, the emergency shelters. And I say a couple of years ago, which meant they've been running for several years. Um, one of the interesting aspects of the, uh, well, two of the emergency shelters for our discussion today is that they were run not only for by public NGOs, uh, you know, but also for-profit private NGOs. So there was a lot of, when we talk about expansion of financial capitalism, a lot of money to be made in these refugee shelters. Um, you know, contractors, for example, bedding, food, you know, you name it, um, were all for-profit private, for the most part, um, suppliers. And I was, uh, the, the sort of bed bug uh, photo here on your right or your left, um, my right, your left, I suppose, um, was given to me by one of the local um, refugee social justice organizations. Um, and this is one manifestation of many sad um, and, and, and just terrible conditions that uh, these refugees had to live in, um, you know, despite the, of the, um, you know, for-profit private sector involved and the managerial efficiency of the of Berlin Senate, allegedly. Um, but more importantly for our analysis, these refugees, once they were admitted or the paperwork was uh, approved um, by the Berlin Senate and, and the federal government, they were housing assistance. And for the most part, these refugees that were um, offered housing assistance by the job centers were paying these emergency shelters money for rent through that assistance because they couldn't access another type of shelter, right? So in a way, a landlord type of relationship. This was a rental, you know, displaced survival, um, rental tenure, uh, you know, a new aspect of, of, of rental tenure, perhaps. Um, so the other um, option for the refugees was uh, communal shelters. Um, and definitely a big step up from uh, living in emergency shelters for sure, but they're set up as dormitories, as university dormitories, right? So families or single single refugees, largely men, um, would share these spaces, uh, share communal spaces that's just kitchens and living rooms. And oftentimes there was more than one person living in each bedroom. Um, and again, as I said, lots, big improvement from the, uh, the emergency shelters, but you know, tending towards isolation and marginalization of, of these, these type of buildings in Berlin, and also you know, not conducive to you know, long-term or even medium-term healthy living, if you will. Um, and the other great, um, and um, sorry, I just can't, I can't, every time I, I tell people this, I just, this incredulous that they would spend this money on this alternative um, shelter, which are tempo homes or container villages, if you will. And they are that, they're containers. Um, and the uh, Office of Refugee 
affairs told me that they spent a lot of money on the sort of first cut of these containers and they're really, really bad. This is the second cut, which are um, better apparently. Um, I, was, I took these pictures, it was like 35 degrees Celsius one summer outside one of the biggest emergency shelters, the airport hangar in Te Tempelhof. Um, and this was the, the container village, right? It's got a security on pavement, but more importantly, the ventilation is awful in these buildings, right? Um, when I spoke to the district social welfare office that was responsible for overseeing the health and safety of these buildings, they were telling me that they get constant calls in for people burning their hands on the pipes, et cetera. It's just, they're loud, the, the, the air quality is bad, and you can imagine how tiny these are to house you know, families in. Um, and they're not, you know, the refugees would rather be in the communal dwellings and or living in crowded, overcrowded conditions, i.e. homelessness, than live in these containers, and I don't blame them. So, again, a sort of uh, trope that was coming up is from the mayor of Leipzig, but also from Berlin as well, was this from, you know, left-leaning parties, et cetera, and progressives in the government, was that it's not a refugee crisis, it's a housing crisis. But as I mentioned before, the housing crisis itself is quite limited in the apolitical and technical way that it is in the media, in policy, as something that um, you know can be just you know uh, fixed through some more neoliberal reforms, um, but, but primarily the allowing the um, the private sector to take the lead and and determining the um, the proper housing prices um, for the market. So turning to the last section now, I just want to note that in the book. I developed this concept of a monetized governance, which is sort of um, very much so a more specific understanding of neoliberal governance at various scales of intervention. And three of the vectors that I identify in terms of reproducing this displaced survival is depoliticization, um, disciplining and disappearing of the urban poor, and more importantly, the structural violence underpinning that place. Um, uh, displaced survival. And some of the disappearances in Berlin, the occlusions is the continued refusal to collect statistics on evictions for me. The only time those numbers are made available are in, in question periods, where then the municipal housing companies are pushed to um, provide such statistics. And, and lo and behold, they can, right? Um, and the keeping with the pushing of, of, of many um, civil society organizations have pushed the Berlin Senate to collect statistics on homelessness. They're making some inroads, but there's still a lot of resistance in terms of um, actually, you know, mapping out homelessness, especially the invisible homelessness. Emergency shelters, um, hotels and hostels that we began the talk are also occlusions of the structural violence of displaced survival that continue. Um, as well as communal housing refuge, um, housing for refugees. But what's really where I see the sort of intersection, if you will, between the surplus money and, and relative surplus populations and how they play themselves out in a more concrete manner is that these disappearances conceal homelessness, um, how homelessness, in, uh, conceals homelessness in expensive and yet obviously inadequate spaces, such as emergency shelters. These are really, really expensive. I keep forgetting numbers, um, but in Dublin, for example, the hotels um, earn, you know, tens of millions of euros, you know, if not 100 million euros just in from Dublin City Council to house the homeless. This is crazy. Why are we not building social housing, right? It's just this normalization of this is the only way forward is, is ridiculous. But part of it is because it's occluded from the public gaze, right? Um, you know, we know evictions are super expensive. Um, why not try people in their homes, for example? So, you know, there's, there's many different um, uh, vectors of disappearance, depending on the scales of analysis that I'm looking at. Here are just a, a few that I talk about. And depoliticization, just to wrap up, I have one more slide, then we're done, um, is the response by the Berlin Senate to say, okay, no, we will implement rent freezes. We're not rent control, rent freezes. Um, 
are are welcome, but they're not a you know even a, a medium term solution for many people. For one thing, it doesn't they never affect the, the public and municipal housing companies. And second, there's so many loopholes, right? If it's a new building or it's a renovated building, that rent freeze doesn't doesn't apply, right? So for example, there was a rent freeze as there always is in Berlin and um, implemented in 2015. But despite this rent freeze, in 2017, Berlin re registered the highest rental increase in the world at 20.7%, showing you the sort of loopholes around here. And then finally, I want to mention that, you know, all this depolitization and disciplining and and um, disappearance, it doesn't take place in a very, you know, one-sided, you know, state coming down and implementing this. There's a lot of politics involved. There's a lot of struggle involved and a lot of pushback. And one of the most spectacular has been, I'm sure you've all heard of this, is the referendum to expropriate, <clears throat> excuse me, large land, corporate landholds in, uh, landlords in Berlin. So that means any, any um, corporate landlord that owns more than 3,000 uh, rental units, which includes Deutsche Wohnen, for example. And there's a lot of tensions around that and limits as well but it's it's really important i think something like 56 percent. the numbers keep changing depending on what you're reading but let's say 57 percent of the berliners sign this and are are pushing you know not just you know rental freezes are pushing for expropriation um which is huge right in this sort of neoliberal moment that we're residing in and so just to 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 end here you know displaced survival and financial capitalism um, in my book, you know, one of the conclusions is that high rents are really important. The role of financial or corporatized land is really important, but that's one part of the cause of, displace, of displacement and the ongoing reproduction of displaced survival. I think the rising levels of income inequality, the over-indebtedness, the poverty rooted in the class nature, both capital and labor of financial capitalism need to be problematized to fully grasp the reproduction of displaced survival in Berlin as elsewhere. Thank you so much. Sorry, it was more than 30 minutes dark. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Um, I'm taking over from Manuel, who is experiencing audio problems. And um, uh, we were actually quite happy uh, to, to hear so much from you. I'm based here in Germany, so it was really interesting for me as well. And I'm really looking forward to the Q&A. So if you have a question, just type in Q and I will unmute you, or you can also write it down. But then I make you read it out to, <laughs> to not monopolize. Can, can I just say, I'm, I'm really fascinated to in hearing your, your perspective, not only in the ways that you're thinking about financial capitalism, but also in terms of, you know, this is a very little crowd here. I mean, how you're even if you're not studying it, but how you're experiencing urban displacements, because there are, are obviously visible components to it. Um, or obviously also, you know, other aspects of urban displacements that are not covered in, in my study um, mm. and expanding on it. Mm. So I guess you're addressing the Fingio crowd um, as a group, which is very diverse. And there are several people from Germany here, but as you rightly said, there are also quite a few others who have been working on this and even a colleague from Kenya who joined us. So, so I'm, I'm really interested in the Q&A. Any thoughts you wanna share? I would maybe start with an icebreaker. Um, very brief, uh, you mentioned gender, race, and class. Uh, you didn't mention age and citizenship. Um, maybe you could briefly um, talk about those dimensions and, and how you conceptualize and fill them empirically. And the second is when you read stuff from the UK or on the UK or North America, race and racialization comes in kind of handy. It, it feels like it's part of that context, but in Germany, sometimes we have problems <laughs> incorporating these categories into our framework of analysis. So, so I wonder how, how you go about this um, in both conceptualizing it and, and also empirically. Thanks. All that always. Did you, do other people want to jump in or do you want me just to? 
to. Okay, now you're mute, Stefan. <laughs> so I, I, in terms of gender, as I mentioned, um, gender and race, I draw on various, so Rabbi Shilliam, but also critical race studies and geography, you know, the, the, the and, and feminist, Marxist feminist approaches. And I combine those um, with, uh, I combine them with a German concept, uh, which is the mode of societalization. And I do that um, because obviously studying three cities and three scalar um, and points of investigation, I can't go into the household. That was not my, you know, I acknowledge that there's unpaid labor. I acknowledge the very important social reproductive activities that happen within the household. But I also concerned with understanding that reproduction of those relationships within capitalism itself. And there, I think, the, so I, I, use, I didn't bring it up in talk using, but I use societalization in the book, leaning on that, the Fikazarschaftum's um, modus. And that really helps me capture a lot of the, um, a lot of the uh, ways in which uh, impoverished households, so welfare recipients, long-term unemployed, also very much are engaging with the labor markets, but also one of the key players within Berlin, at least, that I speak about is the job centers. Um, and there they play a huge role. And it's, it's interesting, you know, the job centers are federal, and yet, you know, every every district in Berlin has one. Um, so almost, and so it's it's it was really interesting to go to Mitte Job Center and to go to the Neukölln Job Center and talk to them about various issues, um, and and hearing then various informants, you know, part of you know the portfolio being more, you know, I am the director of the job center, and so I have this more federal perspective. And you know, Stefan, to be totally honest, race is not my bag. I don't like it's totally I totally respect and read about it. It clearly is there. I'm not denying it. But I tell you what, when I was at my first um, interview with the job center in Neukölln, I was I had a position I'm talking about positionality here, which I think is important trying to understand race. I, I am biracial. I have a German father. I have a German citizenship um, born and raised in Canada. I held a professorship in Helsinki. I have a Swedish last name. I fly to Germany. I don't divulge that I'm German. I speak to them in German, of course. I have an accent when I speak German. They know that I'm not native, but you know, um, and we'll get to that in a second. But uh, the migrant, the sort of migrant German or passport German versus a, a real German, because um, uh, that plays out in my positionality as well. So I'm sitting with the director of, or one of the directors of the job center in Neukroen, who is responsible for dealing with um, the evictions. So if people, People are in trouble with rental arrears. There's this huge, and I talk about it in the book, there's a huge paper trail people have to go through. And they may sometimes get assistance from the job center to pay their rental arrears. And you know, they, that turns into a loan, right? Um, and their wages get garnished, their mini jobs, et cetera. So I'm sitting there with, with his assistant. He was late. Um, and I had my phone on to record, did all the ethics. And he came bustling in and sat down. And he can just, you know, start telling me, realized the recorder was on uh, till later, but the most racialized accounts of evictions ever, you know, these people are lazy. They don't speak the language. They don't want to integrate. They come here and they get money from us and they go across the street at Aldi and buy, no shit, cat food, and then sell it to vendor your price. And I thought, well, isn't that kind of <laughs> the capitalist that we all that everyone's engaged in but just just this crazy he's like not like you who speaks this perfect german you know for her. um and so because of the language it was really interesting how and that played itself out a lot um and especially gender so men a lot men with power um i would get this and i'm like do they not see i'm biracial like i don't really think i'm swedish i don't understand this right um uh, and so that's that was super important. And, and then I went, right, because it's field work, I went and said, oh my gosh, I can't do this without race. Not to mention that, you know, the the, the aspect of, as I mentioned, the, the majority of the people that hold these low wage positions in Germany, i.e. in Berlin as well, are migrants. And they're not migrants, um, <laughs> you know, migrants from Northern Europe. Um, they are, you know, the high skilled elite migrants. You don't even call, we don't even, 
use that for profound. But, but the migrants from Eastern Europe and now after the crash, Southern Europe, right, and the refugees, et cetera. And so how do I go back and, and do, I captured a lot of the race um, through discourse. Uh, but I had to hold back. I didn't put those. I should have put them in, but I didn't because, you know, <laughs> I'd like to go back to do the job center in North Carolina and have this discussion, but definitely blaming the victim. And there's one part, um, I have three chapters on Berlin where I talk about the sort of historical stigmatization of, of Noi Kroen, talking about the guest workers um, and the, then the refugees coming and then the next wave of migrants, the Roma, the Roma problem. So I spoke to, um, you know, Noi Kroen offices uh, who were responsible for ridiculous um, document talking about the Roma problem in Neutron and how they're just wrecking you know, property rates, et cetera, and how we should deal with the Roma problem. So I spoke to the person that wrote this and it was just awful. I, I can't believe that you're speaking to me on, like, it's just, you have no shame. It's just, that's it, right? Um, and so I, I used a lot of these documents and they're ridiculous if you read them and translate them, right? I mean. The Roma are a big problem in northern Neukölln. They're not, you know, they're pushing property rates down. They're lazy. They're taking their, you know, we have to integrate them. We need to teach them German. The parents, we need to basically, you know, I come from Canada. And I thought, well, maybe residential schools are going to be next on the next page. You know, they were blaming the parents for everything. So in other words, how do I, how do I empirically grasp that is through discourse a lot. And, and of course, statistics just showing, you know, here are the migrants, here are the, you know, one, one aspect of, of um, in terms of Vienna, which was really interesting is that um, one of the baby names, the third most popular baby name now in Vienna is Mohammed. Right, it's it's huge, right? And as you say, Stefan, um, you know, I lived and worked in, and studied in Germany for ten years, right? It was there. Racism is there, like it is everywhere. But you know, no way were they going to embrace multiculturalism or anything like that. It's 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 integration, right? And the you know, question is integration into what and under whose terms, et cetera. And through, for example, the job center and its very disciplinary strategies in terms of, you know, giving them, you know, this is the place that you can stay in. This is, mm -hmm. this is the space that you're allowed, you know, blah, 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 to, to you know, social welfare, et cetera. Um, I, I try to capture that discursively, primarily, discursively and through stats. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. And I just have a, a, another, when you're talking about, um, age, absolutely. You know, when I was talking to the um, the debt counseling in in all three cities, um, it came up. You know, especially around um, uh, fuel fuel poverty. Um, I just I didn't cover it, but it definitely is something that maybe hopefully one of you will cover. But definitely, age is is, is super mm -hmm. important in all of this. And then the other thing, and then I'll show up because I know other people want to, but there's also a hierarchicalization of racialization that happens, right? So, you know, the, the European migrants, you know, in Mitte, for example, majority and, and in North Carolina and other parts of Berlin are the ones that are, are like rough sleeping, right? There's a lot of, of the a Northern, you know, um, Africans, et cetera, rough sleeping, right? And they've been doing so for decades. And when the refugees came in, there was a big, you know, um, you know, there's people in Germany, like there, there's a big, what are you doing? Why are you giving these, these apartments to the refugees? What about our homeless people, right? And all of a sudden, the Eastern, <laughs> Eastern European migrants became our homeless people, right? Um, and, and instilling that the competition and individualization, but also the hierarchicalization, right? Like Syrian refugees, even with the refugees, Syrian refugees are considered, you know, um, higher up the pecking order than Northern Africans, for example. Right or Iraqis, etc. Right, so there's there's that type of, of in policy based in policy um, racial racialization as well. And I want to talk about the fragmentation around migrant or the the Deutsche the the what do you call it? passport German because I've never come across that before. But I'm a passport German, so that sort of blood right still born in Germany is is recreated. Like you can be a citizen, but you're not really a citizen because you're one of your parents was a migrant. And you'll always be a passport German, right? Which is super interesting. Okay. Mm. Anyway, I've spoken enough. <laughs> Thanks for those you. questions. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Susan. Um, I have a few others on the list. Uh, one is um, Tobias Klinge and then Catherine Brickell. Please, short questions. Yeah. Hi. So uh, thanks for the presentation. 
just like Stefan, I'm another fellow German who I think learned quite a number of things from this talk that I didn't know before. And I think I can even kind of couple my question with uh, Catherine Brickle's question because it's basically the same thing. I was wondering about how you perceived the kind of making sense of the situation on the part of your interviewees when you were kind of raising pretty obvious shortcomings of the current situation. Um, and I think you, you, you correctly um, underlined just how ridiculous some of these settings were. So if I'm in a policy making decision or in an, you know, say higher administrative position, how do I actually kind of convince myself that that is not just a, a responsible or a humanistic, but just a practical decision to make? Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks, Tobias. Maybe we can take Catherine at the same time because it seems like there's a connection between the two questions. So, Catherine, please put your S. Sure. Uh, hi there. Thank you very much. Uh, the question was really around uh, your interviews with policymakers and ideas about temporary housing and tempo housing. So, I was interested to understand in what sense they understood it as kind of permanently temporary in some sense, and what is their exit strategy? Thank you. Absolutely. Really, really excellent questions um, and great meeting you both. <laughs> so in terms of the uh, perception of the interviewees in, with regards to the housing questions, you know, that's where it depends who I was speaking to and at which level. Um, but, you know, every, everyone is has their own political inclinations. Right. So, for example, um, interviewing and I forget what what status this person was, but they were at the time the housing senators, um, the next up in, the, in terms of the housing senator, they're, so their assistant. And I, I couldn't believe I got this interview because, for example, and, and he, this, may, this addresses your question too, in Dublin, I couldn't get near this counterpart. They wouldn't allow any interviews in terms of their so-called newly formed um, housing sector. No in Germany or Vienna, but lots of the problems there. So I spent a lot of time with the uh, housing, D-R-H-E, the housing um, executive, uh, homelessness executive in, in Dublin who hate them. And that's a, <laughs> a lot of tensions there, um, but that's also important, right? Like this is not a homogeneous unit as, right, with political inclinations. Um, and secondly, which complicates your understanding of the state even more, right? But there's also tensions, um, not only between scales, but within you know, the same city, right? Between Neukölln and, and, um, and uh, Berlin, for example, or Neukölln and, and Mitte. So the assistant to the big cheese of the housing center at the time um, was, you know, we spoke openly and he said, you know, I, I it's financialization, which I couldn't believe, but he said, you know, this, this was a mistake. We should have never done this. We should have never privatized these, these housing units. Now we're stuck with trying to buy them back. We're bailing them out like Berlinovo. This is crazy. This is absolutely, you know, and, and he wasn't posturing, you know, he had these, he's just, we are, we are in a state where we are starting to, to take steps to fix this problem. Um, and very, very earnest. Um, you know, unfortunately, they didn't translate into anything <laughs> specific. And I, I, I just want to juxtapose that before turning to, to, to Catherine's question with an individual that I spoke to in um, in Vienna that was also in charge as a politician, um, as the Social Democrat um, in Vienna, and they were very much so um, protective over their social housing, and they were, you know, they looked around and the, you know. In Vienna, right? They're they're very um, uh, snobbish in terms of what everybody else is doing, and they promise that they they all over my dead body will we ever privatize our, our our public housing units. We will always invest in our, our social housing. They're so important, right? Um, but the expansion of that it was not discussed. There are people in power that are making policy, saying um, and and engaging in my questions in what I think are very positive um, ways forward, but it's that that transfers the policy it onto the ground is very important to understand as well, right? And those contradictions, and that's where we need power, the different types of power relations that are involved in translating that. Now here's juxtaposed with the, um, uh, in Neukölln, sort of uh, the, the mayor's right-hand person that, uh, 
ironically was, or maybe not ironically, helped formulate the Roma integration uh, policy uh, document, but was then in charge of the refugee problem now, because it's not Roma, we have a refugee problem in Neukron, and you know, pushed on the homelessness and the number of homelessness in, in Neukron. He said, look, look, we go out with the police, with the Red Cross, I have this on tape, with the Red Cross, and we go to our, our public spaces and we grab these people and we throw them on the next net Netflix bus to Eastern Europe. That's what we do. We don't care what Mitta does, Mitta can do what they want, but we have a problem when their homelessness come into our, you know, our area that we have to clean that up as well. So there's like all these, these contradictory aspects, right? And you know, Berlin is very multi-scalar itself, right? So you're dealing with competitions between the various districts, but also the Berlin Senate and these districts. So I don't know if I've answered your question, but it's very complicated. I I, I, I listened to a lot of different perspectives on this particular um, issue. But one thing that I think ran across all of them was this belief um, the housing crisis could and should be read as simply this disequilibrium between supply and demand, right? As opposed to saying, no, there are really, you know, class-based powers involved or political powers involved in shaping this over the last couple of decades, um, not just in Berlin, but elsewhere. And in, and Catherine, in terms of um, <laughs> ways forward, I didn't discuss this in the talk, but under the, the guise of the refugee problem in terms of housing, the Berlin Senate decided to lean on McKinsey and company to create the master plan of how to get through their so-called housing crisis and refugee crisis. Um, and in that was, was this, this creation of temple homes and, and communal dwellings. And in terms of their exit plan, I don't really think they have an exit plan right now. Um, and following the, I mean, their exit plan was to believe that these people would stay in these various dwellings, these temporary dwellings, and then move in to get good, you know, learn German, get good jobs, and then um, enter into the rental housing. But even those with good jobs that know German or are German can access those rental housing in Berlin and other, other places in Germany. Um, so that's, that's quite difficult. And they discount um, racial discrimination. They discount how bloody difficult German, the German language is to learn um, properly. Um, and yeah, I, I think the one of the big things with that is the marketization of the solution through the McKinsey company. I mean, they spent some, over 100,000 euros um, on McKinsey coming up with a solution as opposed to, you know, hiring academics. And there's many in Berlin um, that could have provided, you know, urban planners and housing scholars that could have pr provided excellent blueprints and probably could have used 100,000 euros as well. <laughs> To boot um, for their research, and they were not consulted necessarily for this. Um, you know, and and um, people like um, oh Manuel, what's his name? Oh, you're silent. I always I'm, I'm blanking now on names. Yes, um, was definitely a voice of reason in terms of that master plan, and mm -hmm. just shot it too. He's like, so you're going to have only this amount of housing. And we already have this many people that are housing insecure, and we're getting like something like thirty-five to forty thousand people coming in every year. They're not even refugees. This is crazy, right? And in the case of Vienna, for example, that doesn't have dissimilar situations going on. Um, everyone in the homelessness um, sector that I spoke to uh, freely admitted that the refugees coming in 2015, 2016 would be the next wave of homeless people that they would be dealing with. And same with the debt counseling. Um, they're like. European migrants seven years ago, and the next seven years, we're going to have refugees in front of us that are highly indebted and probably homeless. So unfortunately, there is no exit strategy. But that's interesting because that leads to, right, that if we're thinking of this as the financial capitalism, and this is how it's intensifying and, uh, intensifying and expanding, that it needs both that surplus money and the surplus population. Because as we saw in the pandemic, the surplus population is disposable, but it's indispensable, right? Um, mm. For many things in capitalism. Great, uh, thank you so much, Susan. Unfortunately, we hit uh, six o'clock and we want to stick with the limit. Um, we've said to ourselves, uh, it was really a pleasure to hear more about your recent book and, and also hear more about your personal background, which explains a, a few research choices as well, I guess. Um, I wasn't aware of that. So thanks uh, for weaving um, together a, a few uh, strings. 
And um, I guess we learned a lot um, as a quite heterogeneous communities. I think each of us can pick something from what you've just said. But beyond that, it's a real uh, important uh, social topic for, and, and, and everyone should, you know, uh, take something from it. Uh, next uh, week, um, in two weeks, sorry, 13th December, we have in relation here with neoliberal fairy tales and authoritarian uh, realpolitik regulating the platform ecologies of fintech. And hopefully, since your heating has stopped, so then we're going to see you again. <laughs> so Definitely thanks, coming to that, yeah. Thanks to everyone, and uh, see you in two weeks. And thanks Thank you. Mind. And if you guys want to email me with questions, I know I probably spoke too much. I mean, please do. I'd really love to hear from you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.